<laughs> yeah, I did spend about four years at Four Systems, um, which was an interesting place to be. Then it was foreplay, wasn't it? I did get a, an email from a friend asking me why a networking company was called Four and a golf company was called Ping. Could we please get that straightened out? <laughs> Somehow we never did. Um, I think this is eight, the, the the history of ATM and how it played out has many things to to explain why and why not. Um, it was designed initially out of the world of telcos, so it was supposed to provide multimedia support, predictable delivery over 64 kilobit channels over your ISDN channel. So if you were really lucky and you had 64K coming to your desktop, you could get voice and video in a predictable way. It used a very small packet size called a cell and there was a big battle over whether it should be bigger or smaller and the voice guys over 64 kilobits won. And by the time things got done, nobody cared about voice over 64 kilobits. And so it had. Yeah, you came up with a prime number for the size of the thing anyways. So that decision was made in the telco world long before uh, I got involved or Four Systems got involved. And the guys who founded Four Systems had been building proprietary high-speed networks for a long time at Carnegie Mellon and came to a realization one day that there was some economy of scale if you could actually leverage a standard, and they did. They wrote some wonderfully simple software for signaling, but cho chose to not open source it. And then the efforts got into the ATM forum and vendors who had no interest in seeing it successful did sort of the same thing that happened with FDDI, which was nothing came out the door until it could address every imaginable use case under every possible condition. And it was so complicated it took forever to get done, the interoperability was bad, and by then, the economies of scale of Ethernet were simply impossible to beat. In the early days, we were faster, we were less expensive. Um, the guys at Four were so visionary that as strange as it sounds today, the way you built a 100-switch network was you plugged them into one another, and they automatically discovered the topology and set up optimal routes through it. And they couldn't understand why any other networking technology didn't do that. So some very, very interesting stuff. But simply, you know, how do you chase Ethernet when you've got an incredibly simple Mac? You've got massive economy of scale. You've got very simple software, so low barriers to entry to get into the market. And a huge ecosystem that knows how to use it. And along with that, the marketing muscle of saying you're paying a cell tax because your payload's too small and it's far too complicated. And oh, by the way, it wasn't best friends with IP. So some interesting stuff came out of it. And it's, for me, it's interesting to watch people in the Ethernet world today talk about self-configuring fabrics 20 years later. And I look at it and all I can say is what took you so long? Because <laughs> Robert and his guys did it a long time ago. Well. So, to that, uh, we've got a question. I have a question on that. To what you're saying seems so obvious now, and it didn't even seem so dramatically foreign in my mind 20, 25 years ago either, when I was watching this go on. I you all know this now. Were there any precedents that maybe somebody should have been looking at in the 80s, looking back 10, 15 years? before that, that they should have been leaning on to? I mean, in retrospect, do people, I mean, what you're saying is, is, is over-engineered against simple and works. So over-engineered had been winning time and time and time again. The oh, entire, yeah, so there were that oh, yeah, the entire telco space was all built, five nines never fail. If you, picked up, if you picked up the phone, Yes. If you picked up the phone, there would be dial tone without fail or people would go to jail. And or worse. Or worse. <laughs> and they stretched it so far in terms of being able to control the environment that at one point AT&T tried to prevent people from putting third-party plastic covers 
on telephone books because it would compromise the integrity of the network. <laughs> and that is true. So, yes, you're right. Competition changed everything. And you didn't have forever and the ability to mandate. And the forces of the market took things in different in ways that we've not seen before. And the guys at Ford looked at it and said, single network from desktop across the globe. Don't have to worry about inner working. Any kind of traffic, scalable, works in with the telco hierarchy. There were a lot of things that can carry IP very effectively. And things went very well until they ran into this steamroller. And I had a slide that I used in a presentation several years ago at Gartner. And it was an animated slide of a steamroller labeled Ethernet that ran over ArcNet, Token Ring, ATM, Token Bus. Getting in front of that thing has never been a particularly good, fruitful thing to do. You, you, you know, in, in converse, you know, I, make, I must, must be just the right or wrong age, but I was at that time, I saw the power of the diversity. You know, the internet is, the, the word refers to a network of networks. And when I first got involved with the internet, there were a bunch of networks that were not running TCP IP, that were part of the internet, and they had gateways so you could interconnect them all together. And that was, to me, that was part of the, part of the diversity, part of the power was you didn't have to win and have one network be everything. Editorial observation. Inner working sucks. Oh, I'm not saying it's <laughs> it easy. It just always does. I, I'm not saying it's easy, but, but you could evolve into something because nobody had to win. The market could make it win, but nobody had to win. One of the things I've learned from Bill Haw at Digital um, good friend was uh, a reminder that he kept telling us which is better is the enemy of good enough <laughs>